the problem with political decisions isn't that most of us don't get our own way. It's also that these decisions are usually imposed on us against our will by threats of violence. Democracy, as we practice it, is unjust. We expose innocent people to high degrees of risk because we put their fate in the hands of ignorant, misinformed, irrational, biased, and sometimes immoral decision makers. Welcome to Keith Knight. Don't tread on anyone. Today, we have actual anarchy, the two members of that excellent podcast, Dan and Robert. Dan, where is the best place to find your podcast? The best place right now is probably actualanarchy.com. We're also available on all podcast uh, sources so find us there give us a good review or or if you disagree with us or listen to us and think that we suck uh, let us know that too we're, we're we'll take all comers all comments uh feedback is appreciated also recommendations and if you're interested in being on the show let us know as well robert i know you are interested in uh doing a lot of uh, gorgeous designs that i've seen where can people find your t-shirt designs so Right now, you can go to Trubster.com, which is just a redirect to a Tee Public website that allows me to put all my designs on various goods and ser- goods of all kinds. If you if you have a uh, a throw pillow that you happen to want uh, uh, an anarchy design on, then that's the place to go. Excellent. So I want to go over uh, nine movies today and what the uh, anarcho-capitalist messages that can be extracted, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentional, within the plot or storyline of the movie. Uh, Before that, uh, Dan, what is anarcho-capitalism? Well, it's kind of a a loaded term. It can be a loaded term. It can mean many different things, and there are uh, other synonyms that also describe it. Voluntarism would be one of them. Voluntarist is another one. Uh, the anarcho basically means no rulers, so it does not mean no rules. And capitalist means the freedom to exchange with each other unobstructed. So anarcho-capitalist put together, it just means that there are no rulers dictating how you can engage uh, in voluntary transactions with other people. So anarcho-capitalist is basically just voluntary, consensual exchange uh, and association. Uh, is uh, probably the most succinct way I could put it. Robert, a lot of anarcho-capitalists uh, oppose government. What is it about government that they are so opposed to? They object to the initiation of violence against peaceful people. We are all about understanding when and how and why you should initiate violence against somebody. And against peaceful people is not moral or correct in any way. And government does that all the time, all day, every day in all areas of your life, and it affects everything negatively. So we oppose that. Robert, what is the first ANCAP movie you have for us? So the first movie, I picked The Greats. I know Daniel went more obscure, probably. I don't know what your picks are, Keith. But I picked, like, my golden movies that I really gravitated towards as we were doing them on the actual Anarchy podcast. And my first movie is The Founder, the classic movie about the founding of McDonald's. It's about Ray Kroc as he discovers this little restaurant founded by the McDonald brothers. And he sees in it the potential to bring the food, the low cost, immediate food, the fast food that is so derided these days. But the free, the low cost fast food to the masses all around the world with a consistency, a timing and a low price that uh, couldn't be beat and still isn't. I mean, it's it's obviously it's still a phenomenon. And uh, yeah, it's it's a great film. I highly recommend it. It's a it's a it's kind of a hero's journey. It's about Ray as he's just this kind of middling success traveling salesman when he stumbles across this restaurant and he turns it into a worldwide phenomenon through persistence through trying to be the most efficient producer of this product that he could be he really takes the time to to uh set up the layout of each kitchen and reducing the menu to just a few key items so that when you order a burger and fries, they can pretty much hand it to you within seconds as opposed to minutes. 
And that's, it made a huge difference. And of course it became the phenomenon that it is. And it's a, it's a particularly poignant movie for me as I also make a living in the fast food industry and trying to be as efficient as possible is very difficult working with new young high school kids basically it, people don't last in the fast food industry for too long it's a, it's really a big stepping stone industry and a lot of people you know go on to do bigger and better things of course and making a system simple enough that you know a kid could learn how to do it in a few minutes or a few hours of training and be perfectly efficient it's it's a fantastic movie about entrepreneurship is what it is. Oh, yeah, definitely uh, increased efficiency. The amount of time that is saved and gives people the option. Maybe it's good for some people. Maybe it's bad. You're giving people the option to get, you know, um, I, I think you use the word stepping stone, an entry level job to give them yeah, to sort of get their foot in the door, learn how to show up on time, develop skills. And you're giving customers access to cheap foods. We're always told, well, uh, without a state, uh, you would only, uh, only the rich would be able to afford security and all these other things. When really the money to be made is by, you know, Henry Ford, not making, you know, one really expensive car for the two richest people in the world. It's to make a car that the masses can purchase. I think uh, that was so important in Mises' work, where he would talk about how uh, free market capitalism is simply about making the consumer king and pleasing the masses is the best way to uh, get a lot of money because you're also diversified and you have a lot more uh, people to uh, potentially please. Dan, what is your uh, first movie? Well, if, if I could just comment on Robert's real briefly, you know, you mentioned stepping stones and, and one of the things that's really popular with the masses these days is, of course, a minimum wage, which virtually eliminates the stepping stones or it raises them so high that people cannot step upon them. So they are trapped uh, down in the rapids below. So uh, and, and I do also agree that that movie is a very good movie. We had a great discussion on it. I believe it was our episode number 52. So if people are interested in finding that actually dot com slash 52. Now, to your question, Keith, and, and I'm looking for Robert's reaction on this. My first item up for bid is Zack Snyder's Justice League. What? The, the, uh, the Snyder Cut or the, the movie, the, the theatrical? What are you doing here? The Snyder Cut. The Snyder Cut. And not for the movie itself, not for the content of the movie, but for the story behind it. The reason that it exists at all is a story of a studio, a supplier, a provider, a purveyor, pleasing their masses, pleasing their fan base. The market hath spoken, and something that would not have occurred even a decade ago is possible through the power of social media and through fans uniting together to form their own Justice League and get a version of the movie that was long promised to them, and they were uh, originally thwarted by the studio executives making poor decisions and demanding that the movie no be no longer than two hours. And when tragedy struck uh, Zack Snyder's family and he had to step away, they brought in Joss Whedon, who basically reshot a bunch of scenes uh, to make a incoherent piece of crap movie. And that, of course, angered the fan base and uh, was a huge flop. Now, because of the streaming wars brought to you by the innovations and the uh, improvements in delivery of content and the pro proliferation, we're in a golden age of content right now. That was the perfect storm of allowing the uh, studio to go back and say, OK, there's a fan base for it. There's a distribution model for it. Uh, we are launching this HBO Max thing, and we want to give an enticement for people to sign up. And so they promised on their launch day that they would be creating this Zack Snyder cut of Justice League. And it took almost a year to get it done, uh, and it just came out last week. And we all uh, watched it, and it is a vast improvement over the previous version, which was just total shit house. But uh, so that's my first pick. And uh, oddly enough, and you'll notice a pattern here, uh, it was our most recent episode. Uh, so you can find that at actualanarchy.com slash 226. 
Excellent uh, pick. Yeah, the quote I was thinking of is from Bureaucracy, page 20. The real bosses in the capitalist system of the market economy are the consumers. They, by their buying and by their abstention from buying, decide who should own the capital and run the plants. They determine what should be produced and in what quantity and quality. Their attitudes result in either profit or loss for the entrepreneur. They make poor men rich and rich men poor. They are no easy bosses. So, so often we'll say, well, the thing about the bourgeoisie and the bosses is they're just in it for the money. Ugh, what? As opposed to the consumer who goes to stores to just benefit the employees and make sure the uh, people uh, who have uh, investments in their IRA in this company get money? No. It's this harmonious self-interest that the market allows for that uh, gives it uh, such a great advantage. My uh, first movie is Gone Girl with Ben Affleck. So they spend the entire movie trying to pin this murder on him. They're constantly following him, tapping his phone. You can see this just corruption. So first things first, you see that far from being someone who's just working in the public interest, these uh, so-called public servants have their own agenda, just as any human being on planet Earth would. So it turns out uh, this woman has staged her own death. It's been so many years I can spoil it. She uh, staged her own death in hopes of putting him away, decides not to kill herself, and then comes back into his life. So after they spend the entire movie trying to pin this on him and bring him to justice, allegedly, they find out that she is uh, alive and stage, stage the whole thing. And the FBI agents are like, Ugh, don't try and, you know, uh, get out of this. Just be happy your wife is alive. Well, shouldn't you be seeking justice and going after this criminal? And then the woman who is, you know, now sort of on his side after she finds out that she had, you know, tried to put Ben Affleck, an innocent man in jail. She's like, yeah, look, there's nothing we can do. We, we looked into it. There's just nothing we could do. So a couple things. One, public servants are self-interested, just like all human beings. And part two is the idea that well, uh, without government, there might be shortcomings in the products and services that we get in the free market. And since there are shortcomings, we need government. Well, the existence of a government does not increase the quality nor increase your access to a product or service you want, whether it's justice, safety, food, or clothing, shelter, technology, or white claws. Uh, Robert, any comments on that and your second movie? Uh, it's been some time since I've uh, watched uh, Gone Girl, although it's interesting, this second Ben Affleck movie. I don't know if there's going to be a third. This is kind of weird me out a little bit. OK, so my second movie is the Matthew McConaughey classic. He's uh, had a quite interesting career from all kinds of different films. But when he did Dallas Buyers Club is what I want to talk about today. It's it's a classic libertarian film because, as you would know, it's about a guy who gets AIDS in, I think, the early 90s when, like, AZT was the big AIDS drug and they weren't sure about it. They were just starting to develop these kind of methods to control the disease. It wasn't, it wasn't necessarily about curing. It was more about controlling and prolonging lifespans. And Matthew McConaughey plays a character that is... He gets it, and he is literally in a fight for his life against the FDA because the FDA, they have the godly power to decide whether people can treat themselves with a particular substance or not, and it's they come down from on high and make decisions for him and other people as well that, no, this this drug isn't good enough or this drug isn't approved by us yet, so we're not going to allow you to not only take it yourself or even get it here legally in the country or to sell it. So he what he does is he creates the Dallas Buyers Club where he's not actually selling this item, this drug, to help treat and cure, save people's lives. He gives it away but you pay for the membership. So it's a, it's a loophole that he exploits. And the whole time he's fighting with the FDA and he's calling them out as basically not having his best interests at heart or anybody else's best interests at heart. 
he's, he's it's a real pro freedom movie. It's all about hey, this is my body. It's my choice. It's my decision what I put into my body. If I think that I'm I'm willing to take the risk of ingesting this questionable substance that may help me, it may not help me. I don't know, but I'm willing to try it because the other option is to, for me to die in like two years. You have that right. You own your body. You can do that. It's not for somebody else to say. So he ends up like making these trips down to Mexico to buy these drugs, bring it back, distribute them to other people who are his willing customers. We're talking about adults here who are willing to take that risk and exchange their fiat currencies for his, maybe it's snake oil, maybe it's the real deal, but it's for them to decide not for some overarching uh, government uh, God type figures to decide. It's a fantastic libertarian movie. Excellent point. Yeah. uh, Of course you have the principled approach, which is just uh, a home run for me. You own your own body. There, there's not even close to the externality uh, argument. But uh, it, I heard the economic case or the utilitarian pragmatic case articulated very well by Jason Brennan in why it's OK to want to be rich. He says, so this is the essential paradox of regulation. To favor increasing regulation, you have to think the unorganized mass of consumers, taxpayers and the common public will generally be more effective in lobbying for their interests than organized, highly motivated special interest groups who keep offices in Washington, D.C. You have to think that the people who enjoy concentrated benefits and can spread their costs onto others will be less effective than the masses who suffer from diffused costs. So uh, both the principled and economic case have uh, been uh, c- completely uh, articulated you know, for, uh, for, for centuries here. Uh, excellent pick. Dan, any comments on Dallas Buyers Club and your second movie? Yeah, so my my comments are uh, sort of related to um, a Mises quote, or maybe it's a Rothbard quote, where he says, you know, with the burden of regulation and the state above you, freedom or capitalism is what survives in the loopholes. So you find those areas where you can still operate within and you exploit those to the best of your ability. Uh, And I'm sure we can look up the quote and... and, uh, do it justice uh, appropriately, but uh, you get the gist of, of what I'm saying. And then also just related to the whole concept, I mean, this is a movie that was based on events decades ago. Well, what has the FDA done since? It's much, much worse, much more, especially in the last 12 months, um, you know, very much more involved in our lives, preventing uh, cheap uh, uh, cures or, or um, treatments for something that uh, is presently afflicting mostly the minds of of people in the world but uh it was you know hydrochloroquine which was a safe and effective treatment for other things for over 50 years got demonized uh and i think it had political motives uh for doing so uh meanwhile there are these um you know vaccines that are uh under emergency approval that have not gone through all of the you know, rigorous testing that um, even even after all the rigorous testing, there still is no liability for the purveyors of those uh, vaccinations. So it's just interesting that they would prevent people from making decisions for their own selves even decades ago, and yet they're just continuing it uh, even more so. And, and uh, Robert Higgs has a book called Against Leviathan, and one of the chapters in it, he talks about the uh, the unnecessary deaths as a result of drug interactions. Uh, and I think it was like a half a million people died at the hands of, um, you know, medical prescribed drug interactions uh, in a decade alone. And that is a, a much higher travesty than what might become, you know, a harm to people taking a, um, you know, homeopathic drug or something that allegedly makes claims that aren't supported by the FDA. So, a uh, great pick, Robert, and our episode on that is uh, our fourth episode. So it goes way back, back when our audio was even worse than it is now. And we had a medical doctor on with us uh, for that discussion. It was a lot of fun. Now, my second movie it is a movie that we just did last night. It's called Ben Hur. It's from 1959, starring Charlton Heston. He plays 
Judah Ben-Hur, and he is fighting an oppressive Roman Empire tyrannical government. What could be more libertarian than that? He is a man who is trying his best to live with a, a childhood friend who's come back as a Roman tribune, and he wants to maintain this relationship, even though it's the Romans that have imposed in his territory. And only when forced to make this terrible decision between uh, informing on others, which would lead to their death, or betraying his friend, he does the principled thing and chooses uh, to not give up the names of people who might be uh, questioning the authority of Rome. And so this is a great movie, and it's a great discussion that we just did. It's an Easter episode that we did with the Anarcho-Christian, and uh, you guys can find that at actualanarchy.com slash 227. So I think we're going to be noticing a trend here, Robert. Uh, yeah, yeah Robert, you uh, big uh, cheater. Give, give me uh, y your uh, two cents on uh, Ben-Hur. I'm curious about that. Yeah, Ben-Hur, is a, it's a great revenge slash hero's journey story set amidst the time of Jesus during the Roman occupation of Judea. And Daniel's right. It's, it's, it's about empire. It, it has themes that are as relevant today as they were back then. It's probably eternal themes. Uh, there are constantly empires, and there will always be those opposing those empires, regardless of how benevolent or wonderful you think you are the Rome, I mean, obviously Rome and the United States are been compared by many, many people as well as I, I think the, um, United Kingdom and England's empire. But those themes where you think you are just so benevolent, always doing the right thing, uh, correcting mm -hmm. these barbarians, bringing about, you know, instituting democracy, in these places where otherwise they're just ruled by warlords or what have you, and you're just going to go in and, and make these places better. Uh, even if you do improve some things, you're doing so with force and aggression, and people are going to resent you, and they will fight back. And that is blowback. And Ron Paul has famously warned about that, and people have been warning about that for the very real thing for a long time. And I know that uh, the idea of spreading democracy on their world is just like a platitude that politicians use to hide their true gains, their true goals, but people still fall for it. And if you could watch Ben-Hur, maybe uh, you'll be a little bit more savvy. Well, it's not just Ron Paul who says blowback is real. It's Dwight Eisenhower's 1950 Central Intelligence Agency warning that after the uh, coup in Iran, along with uh, what they did in uh, 1961 to Patrice Lumumba in the Congo, that uh, invading other countries and sort of imposing your... I get there's no difference between Washington, D.C. imposing on Arizona versus, you know, Chile. The point is, is that there's not this... That there's this great lie that uh, we're just going over there and we're just being safe and we're just giving people health care and we're just giving people education. There's not only benefits. There's always costs. There's always trade-offs and uh, secondary effects, as Henry Hazlitt made so clear in his excellent book, uh, Economics in uh, One Lesson. Still haven't watched Ben-Hur. Ben-Hur and Casablanca and Citizen Kane are the big ones that I still uh, have not uh, made the time for, which I which I say I don't have time, but... Every time uh, I see a Dave Smith episode, I manage to cut out an hour. So I'm probably lying without even knowing it. Um, my, uh, se my second movie is The Godfather. And I'll be real quick on this. Uh, this is a great quote from Chaos Theory by Robert P. Murphy. He says, Won't the mafia take over? It is paradoxical that the fear of rule by organized crime families causes people to support the state which is the most organized and criminal association in human history. Even if it were true that under market anarchy, people had to pay protection money and occasionally get whacked, this would be a drop in the bucket compared to the taxation and wartime deaths caused by government. But even this concedes too much. For the mob derives its strength from government, not the free market. All of the businesses traditionally associated with organized crime 
gambling, prostitution, loan sharking, drug dealing, are prohibited or heavily regulated by the state in market anarchy, true professionals would drive out such unscrupulous competitors. Robert, and any uh, comments on The Godfather, Chaos Theory, and uh, your third and final movie? Well, if more people understood the government to be just the legitimized mafia, I think they, we'd have a healthier view of government. Uh, for my third and final pick, I not only I do do I think that this is a this is an excellent anarcho capitalist slash like libertarian freedom film. It's also just a fantastic movie. I mean, like your second pick, Keith, I, The Godfather, fantastic film. But this is a movie that I've watched multiple times over the decades since its release. This is The Shawshank Redemption. This is a movie about gaining actual liberty because this is a prison break movie. This is a movie about a guy who is wrongfully imprisoned and he makes the best of the situation. It shows all kinds of things related to the corruption present in the prison system from the perverse incentives to keep people in from the 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 underbidding of contracts of the actual people trying to compete against prison labor because you can't compete against prison labor because they pay them almost zero uh to the 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 corrupt warden who wanted had this sweet thing going with andy dufresne with him like cooking all his books for him and then some evidence comes along about his actual innocence and he has the guy murdered I mean, it's it's a movie about a guy making the best of a terrible situation. Uh, it talks about how good men go into prison and they come out as hardened criminals, you know, in the same way that people we put all the like sick people into a hospital and all those pathogens are swarming around in that hospital and everybody gets sick. We put all the criminals in one big building and people come in and learn from other criminals and they become like expert crooks by the time they get out. And there's also the sense of uh, the lifers who get institutionalized where they only all they know is is a prison life and they don't understand the outside world anymore. It's it's a it's a tragic movie, but it has a fantastic uh, ending um, and it's got my favorite quote from any movie of all time. And it's the most famous quote that comes out of the film. It's get busy living or get busy dying. I think it's a fantastic motivational life quote for those that need motivation in life. It's uh, it's a great entrepreneurial type quote because it really, it, I think it, you, 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 you think about it and you, you ask yourself questions. Am I taking active steps that I would consider life affirming and moving my life forward? Or am I kind of just spinning my wheels and just surviving or even go moving backward? So it's it's a film. Uh, you cheer on the, the 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 protagonist in everything he does. I mean, he's he goes through a lot, but uh, it it all makes sense in the end. So it's it's an also it's an, a fantastic friendship film. So. Uh, you need friends in life, and uh, sometimes you have a podcast with them. Sometimes that you meet them down in Mexico on a beach, and you're gonna fix a boat. But uh, that's my third and final pick. Thank you, Keith, for having me on. This has been a lot of fun. Of course, Dan. Third and final movie. All right. Well, a couple of comments to Roberts. Uh, oh you yes. Know, why not both? We we could do the uh, podcast and, and until we can escape to Mexico and fix a boat. That would be fun. Um, and then uh, this is a movie we haven't done. So I think that it's it's one we've considered. It's been on list for a while and, and we do need to get to it at some point. Also, we had Keith, you on for Godfather for two episodes. So it was uh, episode 197 and episode 200. So I'm just going to be here plugging away on our episodes. Uh, so I'm just like hijacking this thing to promote our work and uh, episodes with you, Keith, of course. And we, we would love to have you on uh, in the near future for another episode, of course. Now, my third and final pick. 
more self-promotion and aggrandizement. I'm talking Robin Hood, the Ridley Scott cut, which is our next episode. We haven't even recorded this one yet. In fact, I haven't even watched this one yet, yet I'm still going to list it as a great anarcho-capitalist movie, libertarian movie. Basically, just based on the premise alone. Here you've got a guy, and this, this is the premise that's been distorted in the mainstream narrative for quite a while now, where you ask any kid these days, and they go, what did Robin Hood do? Oh, he stole from the rich and redistributed to the poor. Well, that's not the story, really. He was in an entanglement with the king and with the king's agent, the sheriff of Nottingham, the tax collector. He was taking the stolen funds back from the tax collector and giving it back to the people. This is an anti-state, anti-government concept, story, and movie. And uh, we are going to be talking with a former police officer. So he used to be in the role of the sheriff of Nottingham. And uh, he's going to be our guest for that episode. And it will be found at actualenergy.com slash 228 uh, in just a couple of weeks from now. Is it Shepard the Voluntarist by any chance? It's not. It it is. It's uh, there are actually quite a few uh, former police officers who are kind of in these circles. Uh, He is. He is. His name's Mike, and I don't know if he lets his last name out anymore, but uh, he did a show called Battle for Liberty. We were a guest on that, and uh, he's a really good guy. In fact, he was just here um, two nights ago because he travels for work, and he was in the area, and we hung out. And it just so happened that we had already previously arranged that we were going to have him on as our guest next. So it was kind of this nice coincidence. But anyway, Robin Hood, and we're doing the uh, the director's cut, uh, the Ridley Scott version. So not don't get, don't get your... Uh, your eyes are flutter, ladies. Uh, it's not the Kevin Costner 1992 one, Prince of Thieves, or anything like that. And we're not doing the Disney version with the Fox. Uh, this is the Russell Crowe version that um, I think is pretty grisly and uh, intense, but it'll be a lot of fun. Good pick, brother. My final movie is Harrison Bergeron. Now, this is the movie that takes the idea of equality and extends it to its logical conclusion. The reason this is important is because so often equality is used as a justification by the wealthiest people on planet Earth, uh, talking about how uh, things need to be more equal and how they are totally on the side of the oppressed. And uh, Meghan Markle and Oprah Winfrey and Michelle Obama are oppressed, whereas you two could easily be described as white privileged males. That is the ideology we are up against. So what they essentially do is they take this idea of things are unequal and it's bad, and then they just extend it to its logical conclusion. So if you're a really smart person, that's a bad thing because not everyone is as smart as you. So we are going to have the state issue you something to place in your ear, and every now and then a really loud noise just starts piercing your ear, and this will hopefully stop you from contributing anything more to society or living a more dignified life than the less smart people. In other words, constantly punishing success as opposed to attempting to have a set of rules or a free market economy which would allow the masses to benefit from the talents of others. So the uh, bitter, envious Marxist might say, Adele has a better voice than me, therefore Adele, uh, there should be a law, Adele can only sing Uh, for five minutes, once every six months. That would make things more equal and give me six months to catch up to her potential income. Whereas the volunteer says, let her sing all she wants and exchange it for money. And maybe she can, you know, perform for people and sell CDs that they can benefit from. And then I could uh, listen to uh, Dan and Robert's podcast. They're better podcasters than the average person. And maybe I could uh, buy products and services from people who are able to specialize in their industries. Uh, I mean, genius comes in many different forms. So uh, whether it's uh, writing a song or playing basketball or making an assembly line efficient, some people are better at some things than others. That doesn't mean it's unequal and therefore totally evil and unfair. All it simply means is you want a free market where people 
can benefit from the genius and high skill level of others by being able to freely trade. So you actually directly benefit from allowing people to be free with their genius. So you can also take the principle of equality, as Michael Humer does, in on page one of his excellent book, The Problem of Political Authority. He says, this book addresses the foundational problem of political philosophy, the problem of accounting for the authority of government. This authority has always struck me as puzzling and problematic. Why should 535 people in Washington be entitled to issue commands to 300 million others, and why should the others obey? These questions, as I will argue in the following pages, have no satisfactory answers. This gives you an idea of how a blatantly ridiculous concept can be accepted by hundreds of millions of people and the experts for thousands of years without really being questioned. So it humbles you and teaches you a lesson. I want to go around one more time and just uh, hear about how you became an anarcho-capitalist, who your heroes are, and what books uh, you recommend or what books persuaded you of this uh, ideology. Robert? So I became an anarcho-capitalist almost exclusively due to my hetero life mate, Daniel. I was just your average you know, well-meaning liberal type guy. I went to a... I lived on the, the west coast of Washington, which, as we all know, is very, very blue, very liberal leaning. And I just thought it was the right way to be. There just wasn't that, you know, opposing viewpoint that explained things from a moral perspective. It was just these other people are either chintzy and they don't want to pay for all these great things that government does, or they're just bad and they just there's greedy and they want to keep all this money. Never did it really occur to me that hey, maybe he earned that money legitimately and he probably deserves it. And it's not really mine to uh, give or have any say in whatsoever. But then uh, Daniel came along, and I'll probably spoil a little bit of his origin story, but he came along and he's like, you know, I'm questioning this uh, housing bubble. And this was about 2006, 2007, maybe 2005 to 2007. And then he started getting into this Austrian economic stuff and he would pose questions to me. And, you know, since I we had already been talking basically our whole lives, I, I didn't assume he was just a Nazi. I didn't assume that he was evil. I took his points and considered them. And I also had, you know, jobs where I had a, lots of time to think. And I would listen to podcasts. I'd listen to lectures. And I would consider his questions and his points. And ultimately, it just came down to self-ownership. And I just realized, hey, I own my own body. Keith owns his. Dan owns his. It's wrong for me to attack Daniel. It's wrong for Daniel to attack me. Uh, and it just extrapolate that. Everything else out comes from that. If you uh, understand private property rights, that uh, certain people have a better claim to certain things than others, and that people own them themselves and the product of their own labor, then it really... It just all flows out of that. You have to think about it for a little while. It took me some time. It didn't happen overnight. Daniel was patient. But ultimately, we came to the same conclusion. That this, this is the best philosophy for a peaceful world. Excellent. So um, are there any books or uh, specific authors that you really admire or uh, really uh, put the nail in the coffin for you? For me, I mean, I'm not a huge reader guy. Daniel has is, is far more literary in terms of uh, libertarian philosophy, but I have read two fantastic books. One is No Treason by Lysander Spooner, and the other is the greatest superstition, the, the greatest, most dangerous, su most dangerous superstition by Larkin Rose. Both of those are fantastic, just white hot books that I recommend to this day, of course, to anybody. I don't know if they're the best primers for this mode of thought, but it, 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 when they hit me, they were huge. Also, I read uh, Atlas Shrugged, which I think is also fantastic. It's a bit repetitive, and maybe I was a little bit open to it at the time, but I really found that that was a, a strong piece of work, too. Excellent. Dan, 
uh, how did you become an anarcho-capitalist and who are some authors and uh, what are some books you recommend? Well, now we've got to go way back. Um, I mean, Robert did tell some of the story originally here, which is helpful. Uh, we grew up together. We were playing basketball on his basketball court, solving all the world's problems, and usually it involved having the government come in and do something. Uh, of course, as I matured, uh, and I realized that, uh, you know, you don't just take money from the rich because they can afford to pay. As uh, my uncle, who's a Christian conservative, used to ask me, like, well, why, why, should, um, why should the rich people pay the taxes? I said, well, because they have the money. I don't have any money, so why should I pay? Uh, and that made sense to me at the time. Of course, now I'm like, well, why, why should the government take anyone's money at all, especially if they're just going to squander it? Um, so, yeah, the housing bubble was, was a big thing. Um, I was a young uh, yuppie type in Seattle at the time, and I just kept seeing uh, housing prices going up and up and up. And I was at that time in life where I was like starting to look to buy a house. And I almost did a couple of times and it just kept going up. It didn't make any sense to me. So I started looking into things and went down a few rabbit holes here and there. Um, and, uh, eventually I encountered, um, probably t a Tom Woods talk uh, of some sort and that got me into finding out more about um, Murray Rothbard, Ludwig von Mises, and, and the, those types. And uh, I stumbled upon the Mises.org site and their 52-week course in Austrian economics, which was compiled by Robert P. Murphy. And it has 52 weeks worth of lectures and study questions and readings. And I completed it uh, in a year. And all this time, I'm talking to Robert uh, probably at least once a week over the phone or uh, in, you know, in visitations and whatnot. It sounds like we're prisoners. And in a way, we kind of are, especially now. But um, uh, so he was kind of along for the journey with me. So it wasn't as if I was like this sage-like uh, advice giver. I was more just learning something. And I go, hey, Robert, what do you think about this? And I'd like send him uh, an article or send him a lecture or something like that. And then we talk about it a little bit. And I remember there was one discussion where there was this uh, food labeling bill that was uh, on like a, a, you know, a ballot initiative or something like that. And, and it was to require that uh, you would label foods with having genetically modified content or something like that, or organic, I forget exactly. And, and I think Robert's position was, well, yeah, of course I, I want to know what's in the food. So this is a good thing, right? We should have this thing pass and have people have to put this on there and I, and uh we had you know lots of arguments and i i, I forget exactly what was the thing that kind of turned you uh, maybe you recall but um i i was just squarely coming down on the freedom and that if they wanted to do it they would do it because they'd have a, an advantage in doing so if they wanted to do it because they would be catering to consumers they didn't need force to be applied to them to do it and it was also going to be costly or overly costly for upstart competitors. So it'd be the entrenched interests uh, who would, of course, be pushing for something like this because they could more easily, um, you know, uh, go along with whatever these regulations were going to be. Um, so that's basically the story. And then it just kind of blossomed from there, uh, got into more Rothbard um, lectures and books and um and we started, you know, doing a show, kind of just recording our conversations and that morphed into using because our conversations were about topics. And then we would illustrate the point by referencing a movie or a scene in a movie. We started doing that so much. that I was like, you know what? That's just our thing. We're just going to review movies and use that to explain concepts to people, uh, which the basic idea is audience member you've seen this movie well now you're going to hear how we're describing what you've seen in a different way and uh i, I think it's been effective um robert do you want to fill in any gaps i know that was a big swing and a miss but you did just season you did just fine daniel it was i believe it was a gmo bill about salmon and what i didn't realize was that there were all kinds of other I think there's other regulations that prevented like the big like they prevented other competitors from labeling their products GMO free 
or there's all kinds of like special interest groups that are trying to make rules specific for their company that benefits their company at the expense of other companies. And yeah, it ultimately just, it destroys, you know, open competition. And in reality, if the, if the people really wanted to know if something was genetically modified or not, if there was a market in it and people were willing to pay a premium to know that information, then those products would have went out. So I, th I think that's basically what won me over. Uh, but that was all around the same time when I was just basically finding out or realizing that, you know, force initiating force is just immoral. It's just, it's just wrong. Right. It took me yeah. a while. It took me a while to remember that thing. My mom told me when I was four, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, right. it took me five years. So I, uh, I definitely, uh, I definitely get it. Dan, you were going to say something. Yes, yeah, so you'd also ask about heroes. So um, I'll put Murray Rothbard in there, of course, Mises in there, of course, um, Jeff Deist, who is the president of the Mises Institute, big fan of, of Tom Woods, uh, and he's been great on the uh, lockdown stuff, the COVID mm. stuff, and yes. of course, Dave Smith, the great Dave Smith. So those are my kind of go-tos right now. Um, if, if there's a Jeff Deist talk or a Dave Smith episode, I'm um, listening to that. And then for Tom, it's like, if I'm in the Tom Woods mood, I will binge, you know, two or three episodes, four episodes in a row, and uh, they're usually pretty good. Excellent work. I'm just going to finish with two quotes from The Most Dangerous Superstition. Great, uh, great pick, Robert. Larkin says, if you personally advocate that I be caged, if I don't pay for whatever government things you want, please don't pretend to be tolerant or nonviolent or enlightened or compassionate. Don't pretend you believe in live and let live and don't pretend you want peace, freedom and harmony. It's a simple truism that the only people in the world who are willing to live and let live are voluntarists. So you can either pretend to care about and respect your fellow man while continuing to advocate widespread authoritarian violence, or you can embrace the concepts of self-ownership and peaceful coexistence and become an anarchist. Finally, if human beings are so careless, stupid, and malicious that they cannot be trusted to do the right thing on their own, how does the situation improve by taking a subset of those very same careless, stupid, and malicious human beings and giving them societal permission to forcibly control all the others? Thank you to Actual Anarchy for coming on the show. Thank you for watching Keith Knight Don't Tread on Anyone and The Libertarian Institute.